question um, on something that that is perfectly fine to ask that question and we'll reword it a different way. <clears throat> Just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I have been with the department 24 years. Uh, so I've been doing these presentations probably a good 20 of those years. Uh, Prior to COVID, those presentations were all done in person. And then after COVID hit, we did kind of go to the online presentations, which worked out really well because we can put more people in the online um, than we could in person. So we'll get started. Oh, I do have to do the legal um, kind of disclaimer, uh, this presentation and the materials that accompany it do not constitute written advice to any specific taxpayer under South Dakota codified law 1059-27. So basically, it doesn't con constitute written advice. If you do have a question and you want it um, back in writing, we feel free to send the email to our email address that's on our website or uh, when you received an email from us yesterday or today, Lisa and I, both of our email addresses were in there. So feel free to send a question to that. Uh, some people don't like to ask questions in the presentation and that's perfectly fine. You can email us um, later and we will go ahead and address it. Well, who needs a tax license? Um, Anybody that sells, rents, or leases any tangible pro personal property or, or transfers any products electronically. And we will go through each of these things that are is in this slide a little bit more detailed. But if you sell any kind of service, South Dakota is a service state. Not all states are service states where they sales tax services. That is an issue that we run into quite a bit bit of time, questions we get from that. Well, I didn't know you, I needed a license to do this because I'm providing a service. That's a question that we get. And South Dakota services are subject to sales tax. If you engage in any type of realty, realty improvement contracts, construction, any type of construction in South Dakota, you are required to get a license first. Uh, purchase any products or services that may be subject to use tax. Use tax is something I had never really even thought about prior to getting this job. Um, so that is something that some people are not aware of. Uh, we will go into detail with use tax. If you have a business with a physical presence in the state of South Dakota or a physical nexus, uh, you are required to have a license. Now, one thing about having more than one business um, if you have more than one business location in South Dakota, you do need a license for each business. You can consolidate it if you have a restaurant and you have them in like five different places and it's the same restaurant and it's the same ownership same FEIN number, you can do a consolidated filing, but each one does need to have a license number and then we actually consolidate them together. Well, what is Nexus? That was a word, of course, I had never heard of. Uh, it is, it refers to the connection a seller has with the state. Um, it's specifically in the world, world of sales tax. So it's a legal connection that empowers the state to demand collection and remittance of a retail sales tax. So in South Dakota, there is uh, both physical nexus and economic nexus, and we'll go through each one of those. Physical nexus is what we are most familiar with. It's created if a business has one or more of these the following. If you have a business location in South Dakota, a standalone business, so you have a grocery store or a car repair shop or um, a hair uh, salon, that's a physical presence in the state. So if you have any type of salesman, representatives, truckers, peddlers, Anybody that comes into the state representing your company, that establishes a physical presence, even if they come in once a year, um, even if they are contract uh, salespeople that you hire. If they come into the state of South Dakota, that establishes a physical presence. 
if there's deliveries made with your own vehicle. What that basically means is you have a delivery van and you deliver things into South Dakota. If you're using common carrier, that doesn't establish a physical presence. But if you have your own vehicles that make those deliveries, that does. Uh, of course, if you install or repair products, you're coming in to repair something or install it, that's creating it. If you contract for construction services, um, use a carrier which provides services in addition to delivery. If you do a setup, any type of setup, uh, that would establish this. And all of these would require you to have a license. Economic nexus is a little bit more difficult. This is where you do not have a physical presence in the state. You may be a remote seller. So it's a so we have established a threshold. The state of South Dakota established a threshold when you do have to um, get a license in South Dakota. And it basically states that in here, if your services or your sales exceed over $100,000 in a 12 month period. So when you meet that threshold, even if you don't ever step foot in the state, you are required by law to get a sales tax license and start remitting the sales tax on it. One thing I will say, a lot of times people will say, well, is that taxable sales? No, that's any sales. So if you do 50% are exempt sales uh, to like a government entity or something like that, you still, if you read that, reach that $100,000 dollars in 12 months, then you still are required to get licensed and start reporting your sales tax. We do have uh, various types of license in South Dakota. The most common are the first two on this slide, which is sales and contractors excise tax. But just to touch basis on the manufacturers and the wholesalers ones, those are basically for businesses that uh, sell to other companies for resale. Um, and so those are specifically, they wouldn't have any retail sales. So those are those, the manufacturers and the wholesaler license would be for that. Sales and use tax or sales and contractors excise tax. Um, if you have small amount of sales and you have an excise tax license, you there is a place to actually record the sales on that. Um, if you have 50-50, then you would probably need to get both licenses. But if you have a small amount, you can report it on um, the contractor's excise tax license. Sales tax license is the most common. Um, basically, it's if you sell, rent, or lease any tangible personal property, any products transferred electronically, or provide any kind of service. Just going to touch a little bit on the products transferred electronically, because when this first started, when we started having these type of products, software programs, um, seminars, it, it, things like that are transferred where you don't have someone actually in the state, or um, it's not a tangible thing that you can touch. It's something that is sent through the internet. In South Dakota, that is still subject to sales tax. Use tax, that's anything that you purchase that does not necessarily go out the door with the customer, um, but is used in your business. Uh, use tax is actually something that even if you don't have a license, it is a law. And if you purchase something and you didn't pay tax on it and use it in the state, uh, use tax is due. And just to give an idea on who would have a use tax license, because that's a question that has come up in the past. Um, for example, a chiropractor or a dentist, their services are not subject, their medical services, so they're not subject to sales tax, but they may be purchasing items and using it in their store. Or even like a chiropractor may be purchasing supplements and selling it. Um, the dentist, any type of chairs, any type of items that are given away, um, then, then they normally do get the use tax license to report those items. The sales tax in South Dakota is 4.2%. 
That rate did change July 1st of 2023. It was 4.0 before or 4.5 before. You can tell I've been here a long time because when I started, the sales tax was 4.0. So it has gone, it went up and then it went down. Um, it applies to the gross receipts of sales, lease, or rental of tangible personal property, something you can touch, uh, products transferred electronically, and services. Um, construction services are not subject to sales tax, but they are subject to contractor's excise tax. Gross receipts. Um, the total amount of money or other considerations received for products or services sold or leased or rented. For those of you that have a license, gross receipts is that first line on your sales tax return. And it includes the following. It will include uh, tangible or taxable and non-taxable sales, um, special jurisdiction sales, which are actually um, city sales and uh, reservation sales, barters, delivery charges, shipping and handling, reimbursable expenses, and lottery receipts. We are going to go over each one of these topics a little more detail later on on the, the next slides. I do want to touch bases on re reimbursable expenses um, because there are a number of states that do not tax reimbursable expenses. We do. So for example, um, you include the reimbursable expenses in your gross receipts. And that would be something like if you did a, had a consulting service and you traveled across the state to do the consulting service and you charged your customer things like mileage or gas, hotel stay, or, um, you know, um, food. So you, you actually have all these extra expenses for expenses to travel to your customer and to actually to help them out to cons do the consulting. So when you bill them, you bill them all of these things. In some cases, people will say, well, when I went and filled my gas tank up, I paid gas on that fuel tax. When I stayed at that motel, I really paid tax. And when I ate that food, I paid sales tax to the restaurant. And then the mileage, you know, is so much per mile. But if you are actually billing your client for it, it is the it is the definition of gross receipts. So it does have to you are billing them, so you have to charge sales tax and remit tax to the state. That's something that's a question I get probably a few times a year, um, or I find somebody that isn't charging and remitting tax on their reimbursable expenses. So it's something I just wanted to draw your attention to um, as it is something is found quite a bit. Any questions so far? I must be doing a good job. What do you You're not? doing great, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, what do you not include in your gross receipts? Um, any credit that is allowed for products taken in trade. Trade in a part of a payment of a taxable sale, then you wouldn't include that in there. If you're, if you're trading something in and you're giving them credit to that, that wouldn't be subject to sales tax. Any fees or other interest for late charges on anything like an overdue account, uh, insufficient funds. Sales price uh, property returned by the customer if the full price is refunded in cash or credit or any discounts that are discounts not reimbursed by a third party. So if you give somebody a discount, um, we're going to give you a 10 percent off uh, because we like you this month. You wouldn't actually uh, charge that. You wouldn't charge tax on that 10 percent discount. Items not included in the gross receipts, but this is only if it's separately stated on the invoice. Uh, any tax is legally imposed directly on the consumer. Uh, sales tax is not included if itemized or document shows a tax is included in the sale price. Um, interest financing carrying charges from a credit extended on the sale of a product. 
Any fees or any interest imposed for late charges on overdue accounts, no account, or insufficient funds. The invoice has to have sales tax listed or say that sales tax is included. The tax that is legally imposed directly on the consumer, um, if the statute specifies that the tax is. The seller, so it has to be imposed on the consumer or it's required to collect from or bill the consumer for the tax. The tax is to be paid or is due by the consumer. Examples of some of these taxes legally imposed directly on the consumer is the federal te telecommunication excise tax. And what that is, it's a 3% tax mandated, mandated by the federal government. And it is imposed on all telecommunication services, including local distance calls and wireless bills. And it is paid by the person paying for the service. Um, if you go get go to a tanning booth and you or tanning salon and get tanning um, get into a tanning booth, there is a, a federal excise tax that is charged by the federal government for the indoor tanning services. It's paid for by the individual and who the service is performed. So any of those tanning booths that was done quite a few years ago. Um, and that's a federal excise tax. What do you not deduct from your gross receipts? Like I said, a lot of stuff goes into those gross receipts, that first line of the return. Um, first of all, you don't, I had a gentleman, he said, um, well, I, I bought these items and then I put stuff into them and then I sold them. But what I sold them for, basically what I got into them is less than, than what I, I was more than what I sold them for. So I didn't really make a profit, so I don't owe sales tax on it. No, if you sold, if you bought the item and then you have a business and you're selling that item, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to make a profit to sell that item to not charge tax. No, whatever you sell that item, you need to charge the state and city tax on that, um, even if you didn't make anything on it. So you can't deduct, uh, you can't deduct what you paid for that item say you paid $100 and you sold it for 110, you can't say, well, tax is only due on the $10. Um, you can't uh, deduct the cost of the materials. Um, here it says labor, interest, losses, transportation. You can't deduct that from the cost of the product. Um, it, you can't deduct any delivery charges, that type of thing. You, you can't deduct that from what you are actually charging tax on. on. Like I said, if you if you bought the item for 100, you turn around and sold it for 110, taxes due on the 110, not the 10. Delivery charges. Uh, delivery charges, including transportation, shipping, posting, handling, crafting, uh, packaging. Um, if the product is taxable, then the delivery and the handling charges um, is taxable. If the product, the bottom line there, it kind of follows the sales. So um, delivery charges are subject to sales tax if the item that is being sold is also subject to sales tax. If you are purchasing items for example, for resale, then none of the um, none of the delivery and handling charges and, and freight would be subject to tax. This kind of reiterates what I just said. Both, um, oh no, this goes into a basically, if you have a shipment, half of the stuff is subject to tax, and half of the stuff is for resale, or half of the stuff is not taxable, a not taxable item. So you have both in one shipping. So if both the taxable and the non-taxable products are in the same shipment, tax is due on the portion of the delivery charges for the taxable product. So how do we determine that? That's the question. It says, well, how do we figure that out? Well, you use a percentage of the sales price or the weight, either or of the taxable property compared to the total sales or total weight of all property in the shipment. We don't want the tax on something that's not, not taxable.
barters. Uh, barters are a fun thing. Barters is an exchange of a product or service for another product or service. And believe it or not, barters are subject to sales tax. Um, now, we're not going to make you pay sales tax on if your neighbor came up and shoveled your, your snow uh, just out of courtesy and you decided to take him a pie or a six pack of beer or watch his dog for the weekend. Um, that is something, you know, that's personally between you. Basically, what we're talking to is that the parties, both parties have a business. That's what they do. That's what their living is, is those businesses. And and one person barters for, for another. So I, the value of the product or service is subject to state sales tax plus the city tax. And, and just give you a ex couple examples here. Um, if you own a car repair shop and you have a friend who runs a lawn care service, so with the car repair shop, he repairs a bumper for you and you, you're going to pay him. And he says, no, you know what? You've got a lawn care service. Can you, you know, take care of my grass or, or, you know, um, do some seeding in the back corner there and we'll call it good. Okay. So both of them are in the business. That is their business. So the car repair shop owes sales tax on the value of the lawn care services. In addition, the lawn care service owes sales tax on the value of the bumper repair. So they do owe sales tax on it because they are in business. That is their business. But a lot of people say, well, I don't want to um, deal with that uh, when it's just a neighbor helping a neighbor out. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that is your that is what you do for a living. So you would owe the sales tax on that. Now this slide is a copy of the sales and use tax return. And we're talking about return merchandise. Uh, when I first started, I had one guy who actually would come in every month and say, I need to amend the previous month's return because I he started doing it that way, but this this is the correct way to do it. I had a bunch of merchandise that I reported on that on that month that got returned to me. And we're not going to have you do that because that would be really cumbersome because especially in a lot of these bigger business, that happens on an everyday occurrence. So what, what you do is that if the merchandise is reported in one return period, then basically, and they, they returned it the next one, you can do a credit. Um, you, by putting that amount, if you see here, it's in the non-taxable sales. It's the line three on there. The non-taxable sales, you enter it, the return merchandise in there, and then that way you would get credit for that. Discounts. Coupons, uh, store coupons, a retailer is not reversed. This, in this case, the retailer is not being reimbursed. The discount, it's a discount in, and it may be in the form of a coupon that you've got. Okay, and just to show the example, paper towels were $3.50 and the coupon was 50 cents. So the subtotal ended up being $3. You're going to tax that $3. Um, you're not going to tax it at $3.50. It's going to be taxed at $3. And in this case, it'd be uh, the state and city tax, so a total of $3.19. And I know we don't really get into it in the slides, but I've always, I always had a separate slide when I used to do it on the manufacturer coupons. And basically what that is, that's where you act. It's a little bit different because it acts as a reimbursement. The store is actually going to get paid that 50 cents in this case. If this was a manufactured coupon, the store would actually get paid that 50 cents. In this case, the store is not getting paid. It's a discount. So in, in the case of a manufactured coupon, the 350 is what would be taxed. You know, the subtotal would be $3, but the tax would be on the 350. And that's a coupon. Like I said, manufacturers, the old Procter Gamma coupons that used to be in the papers. I haven't seen them in forever, but they used to be in the paper. Those were manufacturers coupons because if you took that to hy V, hy V got paid for that amount that was on that coupon. They actually got the money on it. I think they like those, but they actually got the money on it. So the tax was always on your total, on the total and not the discounted amount. Uh, city tax or municipal tax. 
be in, used interchangeably. The cities can oppose a municipal tax and use tax of up to 2%. When I say 6.2%, what that is, that's 4.2 state, 2% city tax. So Watertown, if you buy something in Watertown, it's 6.2. 4.2 state tax, 2% city tax. And the state collects all of it. When you file the return, the state of South Dakota will collect all of it. And then monthly, we'll electronically transfer the city tax to the cities. That's how it works on that. So, And that's really kind of nice for the cities. It's kind of nice for the taxpayer. There are some states that don't do that. Um, they are required to actually pay two or file two forms, one for state tax, one for city, and some even for county and townships. So the state of South Dakota is pretty good about collecting both for you. It's one form you have to fill in. It does apply, the city tax does apply to all products and services um, that are subject to the state tax. So if you buy something in the state in Watertown city limits, it's going to be subject to the city tax too. Um, city tax applies when a product or service is used, stored, or consumed within the city that imposes that tax. We do have uh, city guides, city tax guides on our website, and it, it is uh, set up every six months where you can either pull it up, print it out. Um, there's spreadsheets and templates to, to upload into EPATH uh, when you're filing the returns. They're all right in there, and they've it's a drop down box and it has all of the city taxes. We have what's called a tax match online, our tax lookup. Um, and you can enter in um, that information, your address, and it will tell you what tax is due. It will tell you state and city both. So it's really kind of a, a nice deal. Additional tax may be due if a product or service is used, stored, or consumed in a different city that imposes a higher rate of tax that was previously paid. For example, if you purchase it, um, I don't know if Brandt, used, Brandt used to be 1% tax, so if you purchase something in Brandt, South Dakota and used it in Watertown, um, you only would have paid uh, 5.2. And if you use it in Watertown, then the first use is in Watertown, then you'd have to pay the additional 1%. There was a uh, implement or a um, construction um, dealer that was sold like backhoes and things like that it used to be in Sioux Falls, but they were located outside of city limits. And we'll get into this a little bit later too, but if you purchase it outside the city limits and bring it into the state or into the city, you owe all the city use tax, but only once, just the one time. There are exceptions to city tax. Uh, passenger transpor transportation is subject to city tax only if the trip begins and ends in the city. An example of that is taxi cabs. If you take a taxi cab, that, that fee that they charge you is subject to state and city tax because you're going to and from in the same city. Farm machinery and irrigation equipment for exclusive egg use only is only subject to state tax. It's not subject to city tax. That's a, an implement dealer. If they sell you something, it's gonna be just subject to the 4.2, even if they are located in the city of Watertown or in the city. So they, they would, there's no city tax on it, um, no matter where you purchase it, if you have it delivered or if you purchase it in the city. Uh, receipts from amusement devices are subject to state tax, no city tax. Uh, examples they give are pinball machines and coin-operated uh, tables. If you are buying farm machinery, uh, the sellers should have an exemption certificate, certificate completed to show that it is for exclusive use only. Um, not a bad idea to keep that on file. No questions, Lisa? No questions yet. Wow. Got a, 
That's kind of odd, but um, municipal gross receipts tax. Um, cities may impose an additional 1%. We used to call this the bed, booze, and board tax, and it covers uh, alcohol beverages, um, eating establishments, restaurants, um, lodging, hotels, um, Airbnbs, uh, ticket sales, or admissions to places of amusement, athletic events, culture events. So this is an additional 1% on top of the state and the general rate. If you actually um, you go to a, a restaurant, it's, it's, you know, it's always prepared food. It's always hot food that's served to you or a hotel, right? We do have a question now. Cool. Um, it's regarding sales tax for products sold outside of a city and used in a city. How does the seller know where the item is being used? How do you determine if you need to charge the city tax? So this, when you're charging, when the seller is charging, um, sales tax it's where the point of possession is so if you're selling something outside of city limits uh, you're going to charge them sales tax where they're picking it up if they then take it into a city where it's first used then they're going to be responsible for that additional city tax and then they will be responsible then it's it's the use tax that they'll be responsible for right denise Yes, um, that is absolutely correct. Um, for example, if you bought that backo at that location outside of sea limits, the seller would actually charge you just 4.2. Now, if you put it on back of your truck and, and moved it into Watertown, South Dakota, the person that bought it is going to be responsible for that additional 2%. Now, what happens where we find this out is if that business that bought that backo, say it's a construction company, is audited and they're storing that backo in city limits of Watertown and they're audited and they look at it and they see, well, you only paid 4.2 um, and then they'll assess them the additional 2%. Or that business can say, hey, they go through their records and go, I only paid 4.2, but I'm using it in Watertown. If they've got, if they're filing a return on a regular basis, then they could go ahead and put that amount on the return and document it, and then they're covered. Okay, um, this is an example of the return, and I just want to sh have you uh, direct your attention down to the city tax portion where it starts out Rapid City. The thing about this is you see the codes. Every city in South Dakota has a code established to it, and that's for our benefit too. Uh, what we do is that code is how we keep track of Rapid City's uh, city tax so that when we electronically transfer that money to the city, every month that we, we've got it by the codes. So if you're putting something, when you're filling out a return, a big, a big thing that we do find is some people will just give it all to, to Aberdeen. Say they shipped stuff off, in this case, say say they Aberdeen or Watertown or, or the city that they're actually in. Say this is product that they ship out, okay? So they'll just go ahead and put it under Watertowns. Well, that's not right because it was shipped to Rapid City, so Rapid City should actually obtain the, the city tax. So that's why we want to keep those codes right. Sometimes people, uh, they don't they don't understand that we want the cities to get their tax. We, we don't want to uh, have one city get more than what they, they should be getting. So, And we have another question regarding remote bookkeeping and where is the municipal tax due? Is it the location of the bookkeeper or the location of the business? So if you're a remote bookkeeper, you're going to charge tax based on where you're providing the services or where your customer is receiving the reports that you're sending them. So if you're going to a customer's location, you're going to charge based on where your customer's at. If you're charging, if you're somewhere else, you're sending them a report to say, if you're in Brookings and you're sending them a report in Watertown based on where their billing address is, 
you're going to charge them the Watertown tax since that's where they're receiving the report or that's where they're using the report, right, Denise? Yep, that is correct. Oh, and we have another one too. Okay. Um, if they have an online store and you're located in Rapid City, but you ship to Custer, you should pay the Custer, Custer municipal tax. Yes, so if you have a store in Rapid and you are shipping to Custer, you're going to wanna to charge your customer the Custer municipal tax on their purchase, as well as what you, their freight charges that you're charging them to ship it to Custer. Yep, basically it's where your customer takes possession of the item. Tourism tax. Tourism tax in South Dakota is 1.5%. Uh, it applies to hotels, places of lodging, campgrounds, motor vehicle rentals, recreational services, specta spectator events, visitor attractions, and visitor intensive businesses. What, um, one thing I will state with the tourism tax, if there is a restaurant, in a hotel or at a campground, like a bar and grill or anything like that, the tourism tax does not apply to those. Uh, it would just be the campground, if it's in a campground, or the hotel stay. Um, visitor intensive businesses, and, and just to go into a little bit more detail in that, uh, it's, 50 per, it's where 50% or more of your total gross receipts from the sale of any TPP occurs during the months of June, July, August, and September. That that would be subject. So if you have over 50% of your total gross receipts on those during those months, then that would be subject to tourism tax. A lot of people in the Rapid City area would would actually fall under that. Um, that's our biggest, that's our beautiful end of the state. I always say that's the beautiful half of the state. <laughs> So that, that would apply to it. We do have a listing and our tourism tax fact is amazing. It's really good. So feel free if you have any questions regarding that to pull that up on our website. Um, it, has the, it has the listings like it says in here for specific products and services that are subject to tourism tax. Uh, as an agent, I actually do use that quite a bit. Even just pull up the tourism tax and it helps me out to answer questions. We have a follow-up question to the bookkeeping question. Um, okay. If the customer is out of the state and if the bookkeeper is located in South Dakota, is there no tax due? If you are doing business outside of the state, it is not subject to South Dakota tax. So it would be a non-taxable sale for South Dakota. Um, you would include that in your gross receipts, but then it would be on line three as a non-taxable sale. One question I will have for that uh, individual asking that question, if the, if the business and the person that you're doing the bookkeeping for is located out of state, that answer was perfect. If they have a business in South Dakota, but they are located out state, that may may vary. We'd have to take a look at that a little bit more detail. But if everything they've got is out of state, they're taking possession of your services out of state. That you know they're using it out of state. So then it would be a non-taxable out of state sale. This is just an example of the turn, return when you fill it out for, um, for the, well, the municipal gross receipts tax um, and the tourism tax. The code for the tourism tax is 700-1, um, and it does have to be separate. Uh, again, there are, the, those monies are earmarked for different things in the state. It doesn't go into just the general fund or port, it, the total amount does it. I am going to draw your attention to the Sioux Falls lodging tax. Um, the city, different cities in the state have a, a lodging tax. I always call it a lodging fee because I never felt it was really a, a tax, but it's a fee that they charge for hotel stays in their city. Um, a lot of cities have it. Watertown has it. Sioux Falls has it. 
Rapids has it, but Sioux Falls is the only one um, that we actually collect. Uh, we collect it and then remit it back to Sioux Falls. The rest of them, the cities themselves are collect. So if you're a hotel in Watertown and you pay that fee, you pay it directly to the city on a, on a form that they have you fill out. Um, like I said, it is a lodging. Sioux Falls is the only one that I'm aware of that we actually pay. Okay, this is the tax uh, lookup or tax match that we talked about earlier. This is the website that that has or the link that has it. Um, and it will actually give you what the state and city tax amount is for that area that you do. It, um, it's based on zip codes. Um, the zip code, you can't just punch in your zip code alone. A lot of out-of-state companies, big companies, they'll punch in a zip code and they assume that, for example, I get it for Astoria a lot. If they punch in the zip code, it comes up Astoria. Um, Astoria is really small, if you don't know. So if a lot of there's a big project or a big sale or something, we always have to verify that that sale was within city limits. Because if it is outside of city limits, it's not subject to their city tax. And um, we do verify that in a lot of cases. We don't want a city to get a large amount of money, and then three months later, they realize what they did in error and then take it away from them. So it, this is a good thing to use um, if you are unsure. Um, but you can't just plug in the zip code alone. Um, an address, you know, the address uh, that you plug in may not be in the city limits. So always check this out. We have a question. Okay. Um, if you are a campground that does programming and there is only a fee for the program and not for staying in the campground, what taxes would apply to that? And I'm going to let you answer that one. I'm not no, sure what I, you mean by programming. Lisa, I do not know what programming means. They'd have to clarify what programming means. I have not heard of that one either. So, so uh, if you ask that question, explain what programming means. If you're not charging for the campground stay, what is the programming fee? Because if it's a if it's a fee, you may owe tax on that too. She says it's for the Boy Scouts. Send me an email. Bob, do you ask her? Do you have Do you have our email address? And if you could send me a more um, detailed uh, email on that, and then I will look into that and, and get back to you. Use tax. I love this topic and more people are aware of it than what they were 24 years ago when I first started with the Department of Revenue and I went through training on use tax. It was foreign to me. I had no idea what it was. Uh, if you buy products and uh, things in South Dakota um, and you're purchasing it in South Dakota, chances are you don't have to worry about use tax because you paid sales tax. But if you purchase something um, that you did not pay sales tax on and you actually use in South Dakota, it is subject to use tax. And I always like to give examples. And some of the examples that I give are of a personal nature. And I like this one story that I have. OK, I'm old. I've been here a long time. Back when I started, I was here about eight months with the Department of Revenue, and I bought a new computer. And of course, it wasn't these fancy laptops or tablets, or it was a basically desk, desktop computer. And I bought one through Dell. At that time, Dell was not licensed in South Dakota. So they sent me that, the laptop, and I was bragging at work about it. And um, one of the auditors in our office said, you bought it from Dell? And I said, yeah. And I, she says, did you pay tax on it? I said, I'm sure I saw tax on the invoice because I, I kind of checked those things ever since I started working with the Department of Revenue. So I went back at lunch and looked and sure enough, there was tax on it. And it was a warranty tax, a tax on the warranty. So I come back 
And I said, you know what? I didn't pay. I didn't pay tax on this. And she goes, well, then you need to pay use tax on it. And I did. I went ahead and we, we have a little record in our system where we can pay the use tax on it here. And I paid the use tax on it. But that's something that you're not aware of. Um, and I always tell people, look at your invoices. Always look at your invoices and, and do the math because sometimes the math doesn't come out all right. But another thing is I used to buy clothing uh, at the Mall of America when that first opened up. Love that mall. Um, and I used to buy the clothing there because you could get the really cool stuff, nice clothing. And then once I started working, I realized that hmm, I need to pay the use tax on it because in Minnesota, they don't tax clothing. Clothing's not subject to sale tax. But I bought it, brought it back to South Dakota and used it. So I have to do that. Uh, back then, Amazon did not charge you tax. Um, and I had a Kindle, so I bought a lot of Kindle books. That's downloaded. That's software that's downloaded to your kit computer and you're using it in South Dakota. So these examples, and, and I owe tax on that. So I used to do like every, every December, I would go through all of my Amazon purchases, my Kindle purchases, and any purchases that I did out of state and make sure those invoices had tax. If they didn't have tax on it, I pay use tax on it. And um, I was so happy when Amazon started charging tax because that took care of a lot of that issue but that's what it is and we may talk about use tax with the businesses individual and in individual businesses use taxes due on this and everything and use tax is found it is the biggest um thing that our auditors find um assessments is use tax so when i talk to businesses or accounting firms my biggest thing is check your invoices watch your invoices and do the math because if the math is off if you pay, you know, 1% less and you're audited, they will collect that 1%, the additional 1%. But it's basically a tax um, for anything that you purchased in South Dakota that you did not pay sales tax on and you used. Now, if you are in a business where you're selling product, of course, you can buy your your from your vendors without tax because you're turning around and selling it to people like me and you're charging tax. So it is the same rate as uh, state and city tax. Uh, and we don't want you to pay it twice. You know, if you've paid sales tax on an item um, and, you know, and you're using it, then you don't, you don't need to pay use tax, but it's the same rate as sales plus the city tax. Um, you can report and pay it on your return. There's a line actually on your sales tax return that says use tax. Um, Calculated on the purchase price and shipping and handling. If the item, that item, if it sub, would be subject to the use tax, it would be subject to the freight and handling too. Um, if the purchase is exempt from sales tax, it's also exempt from use tax. And like I said, you only owe one or the other, you don't owe both. Up to a few situations, which we'll get into a little later. Some examples, um, you know, look at look what's on the top of this list is the one I told you about computers. And it's not so much anymore because Dell is licensed in South Dakota and they will charge you tax based on where you're taking possession of the computers. But years ago, computers were a big thing, especially with audits. When they would go to an audit site and they would look at things, they'd actually look around. And if you had a lot of computers, that's what they'd look at. Um, donations. And I'll just say something about a donation. If you are collecting items from different places to be that they're donating, say Walmart donates something, the donated item is subject to use tax by the person donating it. So if Walmart donates dog food to the uh, Glacier Lakes Humane Society. You know, if they do that, then they owe use tax on that dog, on the on their cost of that dog food. Monetary donations are not subject to tax. So if they're given cash, don't worry about that. Um, farm equipment. Farmers that purchase an item out of state, that state may not charge tax on that piece of farm equipment, but if they bring it into South Dakota, then use tax is due on that. Equipment leases, um, if you lease something and bring it into the state of South Dakota and that original lease did not have any tax on it, then you would owe that. 
Um, any item that's given away, office supplies, manufacturing equipment, we'll get into that a little later. Um, tools, snow removal services are subject to, to uh, sales tax. Uh, promotional gifts. Uh, promotional gifts, that's a thing where if you are having a um, open house and you're giving away 100 t-shirts and you bought those t-shirts, you didn't pay tax on it, but you're giving them away to the first 100 customers you have, you're going to owe use tax on those t-shirts. Any software that's downloaded or any support that's given to that download, um, meals furnished for employees. If you have a restaurant and you give away meals to your employees or you take them, you're the owner and you take them yourself, all that food that you bought didn't have any tax on it. And it's not, and you don't, you purchase your food without tax because when a person comes in and orders a steak and potatoes or whatever, you're going to charge them tax. But if you take it complimentary or you give it away to your employees complimentary, then that is subject to use tax. Now, if you give them at a discount, if you say, okay, if you work from eight to five, we will give you 50% on your lunch. That is only taxed at the 50%. Equipment brought into South Dakota from another state. That kind of goes along with farm equipment. Any type of equipment that's bought, you need to make sure that the correct sales tax was paid on that if you're using it in South Dakota. A lot of information on that slide and a lot of information that I gave you. Um, here are some situations um, where sales tax may not have been paid and use taxes due. And some of these we went over um, in the first one. If you're purchasing from an out-of-state vendor or mail order company, we don't run into that as much as we used to. But if you buy it um, through a catalog or something like that and you didn't pay tax on it, if there's no tax on it, just watch your invoices. Um, items taken out of inventory for your own personal use. Uh, I'll throw an example out here. Um, say you have a hair salon and you sell uh, shampoo, conditioner, you know, all the product that goes with it. And you buy all that product without tax because you're selling it to your, your client. Um, if you take that off and take one, take, take, you're out of shampoo. So you grab one off the counter and you take it home. You're going to owe use tax on your cost for that. Um, items purchased over the internet. We went through that. Um, we went over to the next one. Um, rental receipts on equipment brought in. We went in that. Promotional. Supplies used or consumed in providing a service. For ser that's for service providers. We will get into that a little bit later, too. And I will pause. Is there any questions? I talk really fast, so sometimes I have to slow myself down. No questions right now. Okay. Oh, we just got one. Okay. <laughs> so if I'm an accounting technology firm that uses cloud accounting software customized to our clients, I called to inquire about whether this should be taxed and was told no. Should I pay use tax on that? The software program that you downloaded? Tyler, are well, you that's... located in South Dakota? Yeah, I was going to say. Was... Go ahead. Or is your client in South Dakota? And you're downloading the, the software to for your clients. Then you should be, if you're... Yeah, if your clients are in South Dakota, you should be charging them tax. Um, if you're using the software yourself and the company is not charging you tax for it, then you should be charging, then you should be paying use tax on what you're using. Okay, if you purchase a product or service out of state, um, you know, how is this taxed? Um, if, it, of course, it's point of possession. If you purchase a product out of state and it's delivered into the, into the city or into South Dakota and city, you will all use tax in any city tax um, to South Dakota. If you do pick it up out of state and the retailer is, is legally required to collect that state sales tax. So if you go into a state and you buy something that is subject to tax, in that other state, 
they will charge you tax and you are legally required to pay, get that tax. You will not owe South Dakota tax. We have reciprocity and it, it kind of depends on the state. Most of the states we have reciprocity with. Keep in mind, we don't have reciprocity with anybody that doesn't have a sales tax. Um, but you will not owe South Dakota sales or municipal tax if that state sales tax is the same amount or more. If you buy something, for example, if you buy something in Minnesota, it's that is subject to sales tax. Most cases that's higher than ours. Ours is 6.2 um, with the city or 4.2 with the state. So if it is high, if it is equal to or greater than ours, you won't owe any more. If it is less than ours, then you will owe the difference. So if you buy something at 5.2, then you would owe and you bring it into the city. Uh, I always use Watertown because that's where we're at. Um, you bring it into Watertown, then you would owe the additional 1%. Um, so credit is allowed for sales or use legally due and paid to another state against the sales or use tax due if the other state provides for like credit. That's what we mean by reciprocity. If they if they give like credit, like North Dakota does, okay, um, Minnesota does, they give credit, they give reciprocity to anybody purchasing here and taking it in. Um, but it just it just makes a difference if there's if it's the same rate or greater. If it's less, you're going to owe the additional amount. We have another question too. A food manufacturing providing food items for employees, are these food items subject to use tax? If you're manufacturing the food, you're most likely purchasing the ingredients to manufacture the food without tax. So if you are manufacturing the food and then providing the food without cost to your employees, then you would owe use tax on your cost to manufacture the food that you're giving away to your employees. Correct, Denise? That is correct. Just wanted to give you an example for this um, this slide that we went through. If you live in Pier and you bought a computer for six hundred dollars plus ten dollars shipping and handling, and that company does not charge you sales tax, um, then you must pay um, the use tax to the state, which would be 6.2, so 37.82 use tax, and that would be the city tax too. So another one, if you purchase the same computer and pick it up in Minnesota to use in your Sioux Falls store, you paid Minnesota store $532. Minnesota's sales tax at the time was 6.5. Um, and you pay the, the 6.5 tax because um, South Dakota sales and city tax is 6.2. You don't owe any South Dakota tax on that. I have another question. Oh, it's about sure. tax on freight. Um, are you talking oh. about the reciprocity? Um, with the the freight cost with tax, your freight um, taxable amount is actually going to be in whatever your item amount is. So you would add your item amount and your freight together and tax on that total amount. So if it's a reciprocity issue, then it would be together. So it would be the total is what you would go reciprocity on, right, Denise? Yeah. Um, one thing I will kind of go into a little bit with that, some, some um, states do not tax freight. So if you are thinking about reciprocity for um, the freight, you have to look to see if the tax was charged on it. If they, they charge you tax on the um, item, you say you bought it, you know, item, but they didn't tax you on the freight, you would only use tax on the freight, but that's not going to happen much. If they're going to tax you, I've seen it once in a while, but if they're going to charge you South Dakota tax on the item, 
they're going to tax you on the freight. Oh, and a follow-up question, and if it's a third-party hauler, not on the same invoice. Then you, you would owe it, because chances are if it's a third-party and you're buying it, you didn't pay tax on the freight. So just that that would be one to send me the scenario as far as what items you're buying and why it is being shipped by a third party. Because I know there's some some places you go to, you will give them, you will tell them, hey, I am I'm just picking it up here, but we're hiring a transportation company to take it to another state. And there's there are situations with that. So that would be something that you have to give me more of a scenario. And like I said, send, send, send Z this one. You probably have it. I call her Z, Lisa. Um, send her that one, and then we will answer that specifically to you. Okay. Materials taken from inventory. Um, we kind of touched a little bit on that. Um, items taken from inventory subject to state and city, unless they are taken from inventory as a display or demonstration item on a temporary basis and then returned to inventory to be sold. Um, an example, if you've ever gone to a store that uses a computer as a display model, um, the store does not pay use tax on that display model. They would owe sales tax on the display when it was sold. Because most cases, they'll still sell that display model. They, they're just showing it. They're going to sell it, so they don't pay use tax on that. Another example I had here, a grocery store gives food samples to their customers. The grocery store would owe use tax on the cost of the food given away. Now, some grocery stores will hire an outside person to actually do the samples, or that's how it was years ago. Uh, I used to work someplace that did that. And the outside business would actually pay tax on those samples, the product, and they would just, then they would... Um, when they sold it or when they gave them away, they were actually tax was already paid on that product. Okay, if the store withdraws items from inventory for personal use or other commercial use, of course, use taxes due when the item is taken from inventory. So if the store owner takes something off of their shelf and takes it home, then they would owe use tax on it. Um, if the item is sold at a later date, sales tax will be due on the item with no deduction. So if they're doing, um, a demonstration and they paid use tax on it um, for the demonstration, but then they turn around and sell it later on. They can't deduct the use tax that they do, that they paid. They will still owe sales tax on it when they sell it. That's just like anything else. There's some businesses that end up paying, maybe they didn't get their license in time. So they ended up paying sales tax on all their product that they bought. And then they, they come to us say, okay, I'm licensed now. Can I deduct that on my return? And you can't. Um, you're going to mark that up anyway, so you're going to owe sales tax on the item that you sell. If credit is given for sales or use tax that's legally due and paid in another state, we kind of went over that with some things, but with equipment, nice little picture of a piece of equipment. If that equipment is less than seven years old, and it's purchased for use in another state and then brought into South Dakota. It is subject to our state use tax plus applicable city tax if it's within a city limit. Um, and that's on the fair market value of the, the equipment. And I'm glad they added the last, the second thing to it. Years ago, they didn't have the second little bullet and then people go, well, how do you know when we bought it? Or how do you know? Um, the age is determined by the equipment's manufacture date if you have that documentation. If you don't, it's the date of purchase by the person bringing the equipment into South Dakota. So it's good to have the document date, the, docu the manufacturer's document date and document that. Because if you, if it's seven years old, but you can't 
prove to us that the piece of equipment is seven years old by a document, then it's basically when you brought it into the state of South Dakota. Okay, we kind of went over this a little bit. We'll go over it a, a little bit more. Um, city, state and city tax applies where the customer receives the product or service. We kind of, where they take possession of it. Um, if it's, it's really easy if it's picked up at the retailer's location. Somebody goes and picks it up there. It's basically, you took possession at the store. So it's state and city tax where you picked it up. Um, second one is where it's delivered. So if it's delivered to, it's purchased, um, in Watertown, but it's shipped out to Aberdeen. And so it's delivered in Aberdeen, state and city tax in Aberdeen for Aberdeen. Um, delivered, but the delivery address is unknown. Uh, you may have a delivery address. And, and I tell people that have businesses always have a sold to box and a ship to box. That's for your benefit. Because if you, do, if you don't have the ship to box, we're going to have the bill to box is going to be the customer's address. It may not have been shipped to that address, but if we don't have that information, it will be taxed at the customer's address. Okay. If you do transfer uh, items electronically and there's no delivery or customer address on file, it is based on the seller's address. When internet was first starting, this was an issue because you a lot of times it was shipped and there was no record. I haven't seen that happen too much at this point. The records keeping is a whole lot better. So it's, but if it's transferred electronically, keep those records. We have a couple of questions. Okay. One is a follow-up to the food manufacturing. It's if the food item is ready to expire and then given to employees, would the product be subject to use tax? Yes, in the state of South Dakota, it would still be subject to the use tax, even if it is ready to expire. It's still manufactured and it's still being given away for free. And then the second question is, if you are purchasing an existing business with all the equipment, does the purchase date of the equipment start the seven years or the purchase of the business start the seven years? If you're purchasing a business, you need to get the purchase date of those that piece of those pieces of equipment, and and that previous business uh, should have those. That shouldn't be an issue. Um, chances are they pay tax on those that equipment, so you'll want to um, get that information from them. They have an asset list. They have when they bought that stuff. You know, that would be probably in the contract to at least have the documented dates of the equipment. But otherwise, yeah, it would be on your purchase date if you don't have that. But I strongly would try to get that because it might be 12 years back. So on the on the last one with the expired food, um, it's not expired yet. You're not giving them expired food. So she was absolutely correct. And I'm just going to piggyback her a little bit on something. Um, if, and this refers to dog food, because this is something I've run into. There may be companies that will actually donate. It's called spoilage. It's expired dog food. It's actually expired. The date is expired. And they will donate that to like humane societies or shelters that type of thing, but it's already expired. And normally it's expired more than just a day or two, but it's expired dog food. And that company can't sell that expired dog food. So it's considered spoilage. So they can write it off as spoilage or they can donate it to um, a humane society. They don't owe use to, um, the humane society wouldn't owe use tax, neither would the, the company donating it. Now, if they donated dog food, that was not expired, they would owe use tax on that dog. And the same goes with food. I don't think you want to feed expired food to your customers or even though I know it's just a guide, I've seen all the videos, but you wouldn't want to, but if it's just about to expire, it's still going to be, she's absolutely correct in what she said, it's still going to be subject to use tax because it's just food that there was no tax purchased, paid on it when it was made 
the product was going there, there's no tax, so tax would be due when it's given away. Uh, sales and city tax applies where the customer receives the product or service. We kind of went through this, and this gives you kind of examples like a personal care service. Um, and this is services. So services. I go to get my hair done um, someplace in Watertown. I pay state tax and city tax based on Watertown's location. So that's pretty simple. Uh, services performed on products that applies uh, at the location it's delivered to a customer. And for example, on that, um, that would be like if you um, fixed a car and if the person came and got the car, of course it's at your location, but if you delivered it to another city, then it would be based on that city. Um, lease or rentals of products, sales and uh, city taxes based where the customer receives the product. If the product is moved to another location, sales tax due on future payments. For example, in this one, um, and this is an actual one. I had someone in a city that was real close to the border. They rented a crane, a huge crane from Minnesota. Okay, um, at that time, I don't know if it is now, I haven't checked recently, leases were not subject to tax, but they rented it into Minnesota, or, or maybe it was. No, it's not. Leases were leasing of um, construction equipment was not subject to tax. So they took it and they brought it in the state. And of course, they um, owed use tax on that lease because they brought it in the state. Now, if they had leased that from a location that had 5% tax, the first month that that's leased, that's at that tax that you actually took possession of the, the equipment to lease. But if you move it to another place, say you move it from rural to a uh, city of Melbank, okay, and you use that the second month, you need to do one of two things. Contact the equipment leaser, let them know that you moved it, and they will adjust the monthly fee to add Melbank city tax on there state and city tax. So you have to let them know if they don't do that, you're going to owe the additional tax. Okay. If you del if you deliver to a location outside the state of South Dakota, then no South Dakota tax is due. So if it is purchased or, or service and then delivered, and I'll give you an example on a service delivered outside of South Dakota. Um, there was a car repair shop located in South Dakota. Um, People from Minnesota used to bring their cars to him to get fixed. Now, if they came back to him, pick it up, of course, subject to state and city tax in South Dakota. But there was occasion that he started delivering the car to Minnesota. So he did the repair here, but the customer didn't take possession of that repair until he delivered it back into Minnesota. So there was no tax due, no South Dakota tax due. Any questions? No questions. Okay. So we talked a little bit about reimbursable expenses prior to, just to give you a rundown. And this is kind of an example of reimbursable expenses. This customer um, purchased some computer software and the seller of the computer software traveled to South Dakota um, to the customer's location in Rapid to install the software. Uh, so the software was 300,000. The installation of that software on the computer was 1,500. And then they also billed them for lodging and meals, 500. And this is where, of course, those lodging and meals had sales tax included when they bought you know, the food or stayed at the hotel. So that total amount was 5,000 and reimbursable expenses in South Dakota, if you're billing your customer for them, they're subject to state city tax too. And so this example, they were billed 6.2% tax, which is 310. So the customer owed $5,310. Now, talk to you a little bit about reimbursable expenses. They are taxable in South Dakota, except if you are an attorney or an accountant 
and you have expenses and you do not mark them up. If you mark them up when you bill your customer, they're all subject to the sales tax, whether you're an attorney or accountant. But if you are just keeping a running total of your expenses and you're not marking them out up, uh, attorneys and accountants are not subject to the sales tax on the reimbursable expenses. We have a couple questions. The first one is, is labor always taxable? And I guess I'm going to ask for some clarification on what you're meaning by labor. Trisha, you can always email too on what you mean by labor. Um, and then the other one is, what does it mean to be point of destinations versus point of sale? So point of destination versus point of sale is um, the how the taxable is where you're shipping it to versus where you take possession. Um, South Dakota is a point of possession state. So where you take possession of it is where we tax, where we're taxable. Yes. Good answer. Um, at this point, I hit exemptions and I always take a break at here. I have to run and get some water and I will, um, 10 minutes, 10 minutes we'll be back. I understand that you guys can do that whenever, but oh, we got to take a little break. Um, but like I said, so let's go, let's go at three o'clock.
OK, we're back. I am going to start out with a story on our back. OK, exemptions is our next topic, and I have got the cutest little story story for you. Um, I have three children. They're all grown up and on their own. And I was working here when they were young and they hear me talk about taxes all the time. I swear they could do my job. Um, I've got one that is actually working for an accounting firm now. Um, and but the, the funny story that I have to tell is my youngest. Like I said, they heard everything about taxes their whole life. She had a birthday and her dad and I would always take them shopping after their birthday with the money that they got from grandpa and grandma and, and aunts and uncles. And we had gone to, I think it was Target, and she was allowed to pick out a item that she wanted to buy. She was about 10. So she took it up to the cash register and gave the cash register the, the item, and the item cost $10. Okay. So then she rang it up, and my daughter hands her a $10 bill. And the lady says, no, there's additional tax to that. And, and she looked at me and I said, it's a learning thing. Let's 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 let it. So she told her how much it was and that she had to pay the additional tax. And she put her hands on her hips, looked the lady in the face and said, do you know who my mother is? And they she goes, no, no, I don't know you, mom. She's the tax lady and she's tax exempt. So I had to really go around and explain to my daughter that I, yeah, I may be a tax lady, but I'm not tax exempt. I'm not exempt from paying tax. So that was kind of a learning thing for her, but that was kind of a, a neat little um, experience to, to start exemptions because there's a lot of questions and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions with exemption. Now, uh, Lisa said there were a couple questions, but I think they might be answered with the exemptions. Um, so we will wait on that question, Lisa, and then at the end of this exemption section, we will see if that uh, question was answered, okay? Okay, exemptions. Three sales, three reasons a sale may be exempt from sales or use tax. It's where the product or the service is specifically exempt. Uh, the purchaser is exempt or the product or service is used for an exempt purchase or purpose. Okay. The big thing that we have with exemptions is we have an exemption certificate, which is very important. If you do not receive a properly completed exemption certificate, then what we tell people to cover yourself, collect the tax. This is the copy of our Streamline Sales and Use, use Tax Certificate of Exemption. It's used by various states, um, and it is, it is um, pretty, uh, the exemption certificate that we had prior to this was pretty cumbersome. This is pretty simple to follow. There is required information on the certificate. You can't just sign it and give it to someone. So the purchase, uh, purchaser's name and address and ID, if required by the state where the sale is sourced, the type of business, the reason for exemption, and the signature. Now, if you're giving them an uh, electronic uh, copy, um, then the uh, the uh, it's not required. The, if, if it's a paper copy, you need this the signature. If it's electronic, it's not required. You can get the exemption certificates on our website, and that's um, we'll give that website to you at the end. Or you can call our toll-free number, and they can get you one, or email you one, or any of any field offices can get that too. But just to reiterate, what needs to be on there: the purchaser's name, address, ID number, if it's required at the state, and this can be used in numerous states. It isn't just South Dakota. I know years ago every state had their own exemption certificate. And that was a lot of fun. Okay, so a lot of questions I get is like, how long do you keep these exemption certificates? Well, this new 
exemption, this, this exemption certificate, it used to be you had to get it renewed every January of the beginning year. You had to get a new exemption certificate. And I remember doing reviews and I'd have to go through there and go, this is expired, this is expired, this is expired. Uh, exemption certificates, you keep them, uh, they, they don't have an expiration date, but, and you have to keep them in your records for the last three years. They don't expire, but it is your responsibility to make sure that if there are any changes on the exemption or owners, that you update the exemption certificates and look at them annually. Look at them every year to see if they're still, still, um, you know, if this is, people are still the same or businesses stay the same. If it's changed from an LLC to something else, um, so yeah, just keep an eye on that. If the purchasers are from a state that does not issue sales tax permits, they can use their FEIN number, driver's license number, or their state issued number on the certificate. I will tell you this much, do not accept exemption certificates with permit numbers containing UT, that's a use tax license, or ET, contractor's excise tax license. These sales tax exemption certificates cannot have those two on there. They will not be valid. Use tax licenses get is is um, obtained from the department for your for you paying use tax to the state. So you can't buy anything exempt. Okay. Excise tax contractors cannot buy their materials without tax. They have to pay tax on all their materials. So no no for UTs or ETs. And that would be at the end of the license. Uh, number because our license numbers are eight digits and two letters. So that would be at the end. If you do get an exemption certificate, let's say uh, in 2010, this is just an example, and then you do not you do not get a new one and still sell to that customer in 2014, you need to keep that certificate as documentation. If you keep it for three years and then toss it away, you no longer have documentation to support that exempt transaction. And when you report it on the return, you enter everything in the gross and deduct the exempt um, under non-taxable, the non-taxable line on line three, I think it's line three. Okay, here are some, there's, these, this is some examples of products or services that are exempt. Um, egg products, and we have specifics on what those egg products are, feed and seed and, and certain quantities. And, you know, that is, we do have a tax fax on that that has that information for agri agricultural products. Uh, educational services. If you are tutoring, tutoring services, for example, if you are, you tutor math, um, and you have those services, those, that is exempt under educational services. Food stamps, WIC, um, any food purchased it with a EBT card, that's, there's no tax on that. There will be no tax charged on that. Um, forestry services, healthcare services, you know, you go to the doctor, the dentist, the chiropractor, those services are not subject to sales tax uh, uh, as far as your services. Um, livestock, livestock is not subject to um, sales tax, it's exempt, but that does not include pets, people. You can't go and get a dog and not pay sales tax on it. A dog, even though I think you should be able to because I'm a dog lover, but you can't. Pets are, are subject to tax. So you go to the Humane Society, a breeder, uh, a, a pet store and buy an animal, you pay tax on that. Uh, motor fuel, uh, it's not subject to sales tax, it's subject to motor fuel tax. Motor vehicles, not subject to sales tax, uh, subject to the motor V excise tax, prescription drugs, social services, travel agent services. Uh, just to say something about a travel agent service, they're not subject to sales tax, but if they sell anything, baggage tags, bags, that type of thing, that would be subject to tax. Trucking or transportation is not, it's an exempt. And water for domestic use is not subject to sales tax. Mouthful, but I wanted to go through all that. Those are the examples of the most common exempt products and services. We had a question. It's just a real easy one. Is there a fact sheet on educational services? Yes, there is. It's on our website um, under schools. I will actually 
um, put it into the chat for you, Rachel, so you can click on it and go to it. Exempt entities, okay? Uh, an exempt entity is a government, um, which includes South Dakota public schools, municipal or volunteer fire departments or um, ambulance departments. Those are all exempt entities. The tribal government, of course, that falls under government, that is exempt. Nonprofit hospitals. Now, there are a few nonprofit hospital or a few for-profit hospitals in South Dakota. They are not an exempt entity. Um, there's one in Rapid and there's one in Sioux Falls. Uh, the Heart Hospital in Sioux Falls is a for-profit hospital. I can't think of the name of the one in Rapid City. Um, but uh, religious educational institutions like Christian schools, nonprofit accredited private educational institutions, and nonprofit charitable relief agencies recognized by the federal government and the South Dakota Department of Revenue. If you notice the asterisks on some of them, those have to be registered with the state of South Dakota. I'm going to go into a little detail about nonprofit charitable relief agencies. Um, nonprofits in South Dakota are subject to tax. Uh, relief agencies are not. Now, a relief agent, the nonprofit charitable relief agency, you do have to apply for a license. Just like uh, schools have an exempt a license. Governments have exempt licenses and nonprofit charitable relief agencies recognized by us at, by the federal government and Department of Revenue. There are quite a few qualifications that you have to do. Now, it's not, there can be a nonprofit that is not a relief agency, but the state of South Dakota requires that you are in order to get the exempt status. It is an application you have to fill out. And then it is given to an agent to review, and they may even call you and ask you a number of questions. There's quite a bit of information that we do need, and it is on the website, and it does tell you what we do need. And then it is forwarded on to be approved by um, upper management. But if somebody comes to you and says, oh, can you, can you sell this to me and not charge me because I'm a nonprofit, be careful. And what you should say is, I'll have you fill out this exemption certificate, uh, and you'll need to put down your number, your exemption number. If they say, I don't have one, then they they can fill out the exemption certificate without that number. They're, they're, they're not considered and approved with the state. Um, like I said, there are a lot of nonprofits out there. There's not as many nonprofit charitable relief agencies. Churches are not exempt. Um, I used to be on the board of a church in Aberdeen when I lived there, and I remember going through the bills and not thinking that I needed to pay tax on some stuff. But churches are not exempt. They are not exempt from sales tax, I should say. They are exempt from certain things. There are certain other taxes that they are, but churches, they are not ex are sales tax. So if you are mowing a church's yard uh, or, or you know, the, the property, um, charge them sales tax on your lawn care service if you're lawn care or if you're selling to a church, they are not exempt. We have a couple questions. Okay. The first first one is, are coin laundry exempt? Coin laundry um, facilities are not exempt, but instead of charging or remitting sales tax, there is an annual fee that the state does charge to have those. It's based on the number of washer and dryers that you have in each facility. Um, there is more information about that on our website. And then the second one is, are we required to retain a sales tax exemption form on a school even though they are exempt? You can keep one on file for them or when you receive payment from a school, you can uh, make sure that the form of payment that you receive from them is from the school account. So it can say the payment, the check that you receive is from the Watertown School District, and that shows that that copy of that check is from the Watertown School District. So that's an exempt entity fund. 
Just keep in mind, PTOs are not exempt from their items that they're purchasing if they're buying a, in that parent-teacher organizations or somebody selling that type of thing that's not actually getting payment from the school. Um, so if they are selling for fundraisers and stuff like that under the PTO parent-teacher organizations, those are not exempt. Okay, employees or representatives of an exempt entity must pay sales tax, sales and city tax if they use a personal check or credit card. Uh, and, and this talks about lodging too, and this has to do with it. I always give an example at the state. We uh, travel all over the state for different meetings and stuff. If we make a reservation and we pay with our credit card and we're going to get reimbursed by the state, um, the government, we would pay sales tax. We wouldn't be exempt from the sales tax. If it is being directly billed to the state and we're not paying it personally, then that would be exempt. There would be no sales uh, tax on there. Now we may have to pay a fee or you know something else, uh, uh, the occupancy fee or the lodging fee, but we wouldn't have to pay the sales tax if it's direct billed. But if it's paid personally, um, on our own personal credit cards, then we would pay the tax. Now, certain government entities um, must provide an exemption certificate or a vendor must keep documentation to show that purchase was paid from government funds. She kind of talked about government funds. That's with the school too. If you have documentation to show that the purchase was paid from government funds, then you're good to go. Um, it may include a purchase order or check stub um, when a purchase is made with a government credit card, in the case of the military, a lot of cases they have a government credit card. And we do have uh, tax facts on that too, as far as lodging. The imprint of the credit card must be kept as documentation because you can tell on the face of the card if it's the actual government card. And I know that I was in the military, so I had a government card that I used for lodging purposes. So then the sales tax was exempt. And we had just another question um, about the payment from or the exemption for municipalities and governments. Are they required to retain it? You will want to retain the forms, either the exemption or the copy of the payment from either schools or governments for the three years that you're required to maintain the documentation for the state. Yes. Definitely. Um, exempt transactions. They include a sale for resale, and that's pretty simple. That's your buying product that you're going to resell or you're buying a service that you're going to resell. Um, drop shipments are out of state. That would be exempt. Anything shipped out of state. Certain repair parts for egg machinery. Um, like we talked about before, egg machinery is subject to or egg equipment is subject to the 4.2 state tax, but repairs to that egg equipment is exempt. So there would be no sales tax due on the repair of that piece of farm equipment, but it has to be exclusively for farm use. Um, and the direct pay permit. Um, there are just a few people that have a direct pay permit or businesses that have it in the state. Um, they can purchase their items um, without tax upfront. Okay, just to go into a little bit sales for resale, and that's it's pretty simple that it, businesses can purchase items exempt from sales tax if they're turning around and selling it, renting or leasing those items and charging tax at that point as a normal course of their business. Items can be purchased for resale if they become part of a, a product of you know, manufacturing, for example, purchases material that goes into a product that they're going to sell. Um, service providers must pay sales tax on all products and services they purchase unless, unless there's a specific exemption. Just to give you some examples, um, a store that sells clothing, for example, on that first one, they can buy the, the clothing without tax. Um, and if they uh, come become a if someone's building plant sales, I thought shelves. I thought you'd like this, and they're selling it 
uh, Lisa, I thought you liked this. So if someone is buying a uh, product to build these shelves that you can sell to put your plants on, you can buy the, the uh, materials that go into those shelves without tax because you're putting it, making it into a final product and then you're selling it to the end consumer. Um, welders uh, can purchase welding rod. Uh, service providers, they can purchase welding rod without tax, but they must pay for the gases because it's, uh, uh, and a body shop can buy parts for resale. Um, but a lot of their supplies that they use in shop, they need to pay sales tax on. We have a question, and if it's um, if we resell to parts to a farmer that is tax exempt, do we charge sales tax to them? Um, it would depend on the part. You can they're exempt for tractors or anything that is considered ag use only. So if it's a replacement part for their tractor that's non-taxable but if you're replacing if they're selling you're selling a part to them to replace on their semi that is taxable so i would refer to our tax facts that we have that goes over what is considered ag and what is not considered not ag keep keep in mind that you know farmers are exempt for certain ag products not everything across the board a farmer is not an exempt entity. They're exempt from certain pro the products, certain products that they buy are exempt, but a farmer is not an exempt entity. So keep that in mind. Like she said, if those, anybody that has, you know, that's a farmer that has a piece of farm equipment that's purchasing parts for that piece of farm equipment can purchase it exempt. But if they're buying it for their, for their truck, or like she said, their semi, that, that would not be exempt. And it's always a good idea um, to get that exemption certificate because you can, you know, if, they, if they'll fill that out for you too and keep that on file. But keep in mind, they're not exempt from all products. Um, they, they're not able to buy all products without tax. Manufacturers. Uh, with a manufacturer, any type of raw materials that become part of the item sold, of course, can be purchased tax exempt for resale because the manufacturer is building something and then turning around and selling it, whether they're selling it to a distributor or the end consumer. In most cases, they're selling it to a distributor that is going to resell it to the end consumer. So in that case, they can purchase the the raw materials that go into it. They can also purchase containers that um, they put the product in and ship it out to. That, that would be without tax. And then there is some examples of those containers um, and shipping labels and that type of thing that they can buy without tax. But then there are some things that they do have to pay that are taxable. And down on the bottom is the items that they have to pay. So we went over some of the, the non-taxable. Any type of component parts, labels, we went over welding wire. Pallets can be purchased without tax, containers, raw materials, um, something. Prescription safety glasses can be purchased without uh, tax, but operating expenses um, is taxable. Sandpaper, the gases, electricity, prototypes, prototypes and molds. Uh, and I'm just going to touch bases on this, and it's because I have some history with that. Uh, a prototype or mold, um, if you do a die cast mold, if anyone's familiar with that, that it sometimes is provided to the manufacturer by the customer. But keep in mind, the manufacturer is going to owe use tax on it because the, man, the, the customer may not have paid sales tax on those molds. The manufacturer is using it to build the product. They do have to pay use tax on those if sales tax was not paid uh, because they are actually using them. They cannot make that product without it. So they are a user of those molds and prototypes. Um, any type of consumable services, any repair or any safety glasses that aren't prescription, they have to pay tax on those. Services purchased as part of the manufacturing process may be purchased for resale. Um, some businesses say, say a manufacturer is building trucks. 
So they're building a whole whole truck cabs. So they may purchase a service, uh, buy for resale, a service from a service provider for welding. In this case, you know, we got the welder up there, so I'll throw that in it. As long as the two, cri two criteria that is listed there are met, where the purchaser of the service does not use the service in any manner, and the service is delivered or resold with no alteration. So a manufacturer can hire like a painting service to paint, say he makes lawn lawnmower parts. So he's making lawnmower parts. He can purchase uh, the painter um, to paint the parts. He will not owe use tax on that service. The service is to be resold to the customer without alteration, and the manufacturer may purchase the painting service for resale and must provide the painting service with an exemption certificate. But if that same lawnmower manufacturer contracts with an engineer to design a new mower, um, the manufacturer cannot purchase their service for resale, the engineering service for resale, because the design does not become part of the mower. It's just the design. The manufacturer uses that design to, to build that mower. So the engineer services are subject to sales tax. They cannot purchase the engineer services for tax. There's three criteria for service pro providers to purchase service for resale. Um, service providers can purchase another service for resale if the service is delivered to a specific customer uh, in conjunction with the services contracted to that. I'll give you an example because that's a lot of words, okay? I always give examples um, and some people think it's crazy, but it's just the way that I learn. So, okay, in this case, let's go with a computer software company that hires a programmer. That programmer cust customizes a program for a specific client. The sale meets the three criteria. It's for one specific client. That's, that's the thing to remember, okay? It does meet the three criteria here. It's on, on behalf of a current customer. Does The purchaser does not use service in any manner and it's delivered or resold with no alteration or change. Okay, so it is for the, it is per programmer, uh, the software company hires a programmer to customize it for a specific client. But if it's the other way, if the computer software company hires it to develop a brand new program that a number of people are gonna end up using in the long run. So they're developing this long and copies this and markets it, the program to the public. This service is taxable because the program services are being used by the software company. That software company is using those services to build this program to resell. Okay, the other one, Lisa is the client and that software company is doing it specifically for Lisa. So that's the difference. Oh, this makes me hungry. Um, retailers can uh, purchase containers exempt from sales tax if the retailer purchases the container free of charge. Just for example, this is McDonald's and cookie places, pizza. So these to-go boxes, you know, uh, those are free. They're, they're, you know, it holds the product that you're sold and you're taking it out. So the container, um, the retailer reuses though, if they have a container that they reuse, they cannot be purchased for resale. Um, some containers are the boxes here, the bags, um, you know, things like that. Keep in mind, um, certain things can be purchased for resale, certain things can cannot, and we do have tax facts on these. Um, straws cannot. Lids on the top of a cup cannot, the cup can, but the lids on the top. And the reasoning behind that was they're not necessary for the drink. So, and any type of things that a restaurant may buy as far as like trays, you get a tray when you go up, well, you don't, you can't do that anymore. But when you go up to a fast food place, you get a tray, you take it back to your, where you're sitting down and eating those trays that would, ha you'd have to buy that with tax because the because the retailer is reusing that over and over again. It's like pots and pans.
here we got egg equipment here. This is a good thing. Um, egg equipment is subject to sales tax, state tax, no city tax. We went over that. That's basically farm machinery, attachment units, and irrigation equipment. When it's primarily used for egg purposes. Okay. Exempt from sales tax are the parts or repairs to the farm machinery, uh, maintenance items, you know, uh, seed if it's sold in quantities of 25 pounds or more, fertilizers that are sold in 500 pounds or more, pesticides, motor fuel, and electricity, but used to power irrigation pumps. They can't purchase electricity exempt used for their shop or for their home. Um, so like I said, they're exempt from some things, but they're not considered an exempt entity, exempt from everything, all their sales. So you've got to really be careful when you're selling um, and what they're buying. And, and the reason the seed thing is, if you are selling seed and a contractor comes in and buys seed, because some of them do, they will come in and buy seed uh, what, over 25 pounds to uh, say they did some work on a boulevard and they got to seed it. That would be taxable for that contractor. It would be taxable. Okay, tribal tax collection agreements. We have agreements with uh, five tribes in South Dakota. And what those agreements basically do is we collect the tax, just like we do for the cities. We collect the tax for them. And then on a monthly basis, we electronically transfer that money to these five tribes. That's the, that's the agreement we have. And those five are Standing Rock, Rosebud, Cheyenne, Ogallala, and Crow Creek. We do have two tribes that we do have a limited collection agreements for use and, and, ex, and contractors excise tax. That would be the Yankton Sioux and Sisseton Wapaton. The tribes that we don't have any collection agreements with are Flandreau, Lowell, Brule. Yeah, those two. Um, Tribal Revenue Department has jurisdiction over licenses owned and operated by enrolled members of their own tribe. The state handles all the other licenses. Keep in mind, I think that we talk about that in the next slide here. Tribes may impose tribal tax in addition to the sales tax in the form of a TECRO or TARO, track, taro tax. So what I always tell people to do is once you get the license, you got a license with the state of South Dakota, uh, contact those tribes to make sure that you're aware of any permits or any other taxes that you need to pay. Um, yeah, Flander Lowell Brewer has no contractors, excise sales, or use tax agreements with the state. So sales of products or services delivered into Indian country without a sales tax collection agreement are subject to the state sales tax. So if we don't have agreement, we collect the tax and then we keep that tax. If we have an agreement with the, the tribal, um, we collect the tax and then we remit the tax back to the tribes, into each tribe. Oh, okay. Sales by an enrolled tribal member on a non-agreement Indian country controlled by that member's tribe are not subject to state sales tax. So on a non-agreement Indian country, you have a tribal member selling to another tribal member. That's not subject to South Dakota state tax between the two of them, if they're the same, enrolled on the same tribe. Sales off Indian country are subject to state and city tax based on the location. So if they come and purchase something in Watertown, it'd be subject to state tax and Watertown city tax. This is very important. If you're selling to an agreement reservation, all sales and use tax is reported on the state sales tax return. You include all of it in line one. You deduct the sales on tribal government on non-taxable you know, non-taxable sales for, on, for any tribe on line three, okay? 
you deduct the taxable sales made within the, the, the tribe under the special jurisdiction. I think we have, I'll show you on the next slide, it's easier. But you always have to remember to put that amount back down under the special jurisdiction portion, or if it's deducted out and it's not put back down there, the tribes do not get it because that's how we code it. Years ago, we used to have projects that we had to go through because these were red, these were brought up to us. Now the system actually catches it and we get red flags and then we have to. But it's gotten a lot better. It will it it really has that way. So this is the form. See how under the gross sales, there's gross sales, there's non-taxable sales, then there's special jurisdiction sales. That's basically the tribal sales, and that's all being deducted. Three and four, we're deducting that amount, okay? So then it comes down to the 5,000 with this deduction, the 5,000 is the state tax. So that's 4.2, so that's 210. So what it does is we turn around and take that $1,000 um, that was deducted under line four, and we put it back under um, RBST, that is the, the 4.2%. And then the mission, which is the uh, 2%. And then Pierre had, the 5,000 must have been in Pierre. So Pierre gets that 5,000 and then um, the tribe will get the 42 and the 20. That will be actually electronically transferred monthly to the tribe. So that's how they get it. A lot of times what would happen is they would do the deduction and then they wouldn't put it back down under the city special jurisdiction. And then the state didn't get the tax and the city and, and the and the tribes didn't get the tax. But now it will give us a red flag when that happens so we can make sure that doesn't happen. Oh, any questions, Lisa? No questions. Nine one one emergency surcharge. It basically July first. That surcharge is going up to two dollars. It's one point two five per service user line, um, but it is it is going up. That is under South Dakota codified law thirty five forty five. Uh, we do have, I'm not going to go into great detail on that because it's kind of complicated. Um, and I don't know if we have a lot of people under there, but we do have a 911 emergency surcharge tax fax that um, you can find online that really explains it great in great detail. Um, basically, it's a surcharge. Returns payment must be filed and paid timely. And it has to be 911 surcharge has to be filed electronically, has to be on EPATH. Um, but more and more people are doing almost everything on EPATH. So if you have any questions on that, um, I will say to either check that tax fax out. And if you have any other more any other questions, you can always email me and I can um, oops, I can go into more detail with that. There are uh, two, well, there's two two accounting methods that we set up, either cash accounting or accrual accounting. Um, when you apply for a license, we set this up. Uh, accrual accounting, and some of these accountants know this already, uh, basically that's you, you charge something in the month of May and you pay the tax on your May return, okay? Uh, bill, billings, it's accrual. It's really easy, easy way of accounting. My mother worked in a bank and she said that is always the way to do accrual accounting because everything you build in that month, then pay the tax in that month. Cash accounting is based on when you get paid. So whatever you bill in that month, whatever you got paid in that month, that goes on your return and that's cash accounting. And that that is... Um, easier on the pocketbook, I'd say, because you're not paying tax until you get paid. But you can't do any bad debts at the end of the year with cash accounting. Accrual accounting, you can bad debt it at the end of the year if you haven't been paid by the end of the year. Um, the conditionals, the, and, and it kind of explains the bad debts here, the credits for bad debt on there, conditional sales. 
if you change, if you are, say you are filing under cash accounting and you're really, you've got that registered with the state under cash accounting, but you're really doing accrual, you'll need to change your accounting methods with the state. Um, and you can just do it in writing. You can um, send an email or send, send a, a, a letter to request it in writing and we can get that changed for you. We have a question. Is it possible to get printed copies of some of the slides? Um, I thought that when they sent you that first email, there was a attachment to the email that had all the slides. But if not, if you didn't get it, uh, put your e uh, let Lisa know and we can email you, you know, which one if you didn't get it. But the first email you got, um, the administrator that handled this, I know she sent me a copy of it. It had a copy of all the slides in there too. But if you didn't get it, let us know. We'll certainly send you it. Okay, collection allowance. Um, basically what the collection allowance is compensation from us for the expense of collecting and paying the tax. In 2014, this was enacted. Um, that stated that we'll give you a certain amount of money back if you file um, the returns, but only if you file electronically. And you also must file and pay in a timely manner. What it is, it's 1.5% of the gross amount to do, amount due, but it does not exceed $70. That's the maximum. Um, it's not allowed if the retailer uses a CSP. Um, and it's not allowed for if outstanding returns or balances are due. So basically, you have to file online on time. And if you have a balance on a previous return that you filed, it will not give it to you on the next month. Unfortunately, it does not apply to excise tax returns or use tax reported on excise tax returns. It's only for sales and use tax. But just keep in mind, online on time. Uh, file a tax return each reporting period, even if you don't have any business that's conducted or income received. Let me say that again, because I say that almost every single time I talk to someone on the phone. If you have a sales tax license and you do not have anything, say you've been filing returns on a regular basis, and all of a sudden um, June comes along and you don't do anything, you take vacation, so you're not doing anything. Um, so that return is going to be nothing. You didn't sell anything. You, you took a vacation, a hiatus. Always file the return. We uh, One one agent said it really kind of cute. We don't have a crystal ball. So we don't know that you went on vacation or we don't know that maybe you just decided to take a month off. Um, you might have a slow period in the winter time where summer you're really busy. Always file the return even if it is zero. Hey, um, we do determine when you apply for the license, uh, an agent will contact you um, and we will go over things. We, we kind of research the license first uh, or the information that we receive, and then we'll go over uh, things with you. And one of those things that we go over is how often you are going to file. Uh, filing schedules determine um, when the license is issued, and it can be monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, or seasonal. Some, there's some seasonal businesses that are just in the summer. There's some seasonal business just in the winter. So we can adjust to that. But we will determine that at the time of the license. licensing. Sometimes you will start out where you're really kind of slow to start out with. Two years later, you took off and you're making tons of money. We may change your filing at that point. Um, but uh, we will you know, explain that all to you when we issue the license. Okay, our online filing is called ePath. Um, it is awesome. Most people are, when, once they started, they don't want to go back to paper at all. We had a program called Quest before that was rather cumbersome. I didn't even like to call, a, answer questions for people. It was, it was hard for me, but this is really a good program. It's available 24 seven. So if you want to file your return at two o'clock in the morning, you can't sleep, that's fine. It gives you multiple payment options, um, allows additional users if you've got uh, you've got the owner and you want to add two people to use it, you can do that. 
uh, saves for a later date. You can change password. It's a one-stop shop. It's really kind of nice. Um, you can mend your returns online. It does a history. So at the end of the year, when you need all those returns, you can uh, set up a report and it gives you all of the figures. But I will tell people, please make make paper copies even when you file a return because your computer might crash or, you know, I I know I'm a paper junkie, but just just do it till, you know, if you can. Um, you can view pending payments and make changes to payment up to two business days prior to the settlement date. So it's, it's a lot user friendly. It's very user friendly compared to our last system that we had. Okay. You can file uh, ACH credit, ACH debit, but you can also pay by credit card. Keep in mind, if you file by credit card, there is a 2.45% convenience fee charge for each credit card payment. That doesn't go to the state, that goes to the credit card company. So. Some of the record keeping things that we do suggest that people keep, uh, any business that's subject to sales or excise must keep records for three years. The state requires you to keep the records to go back three years. These are some, I'm not going to read through all these. You've got these here. One thing I will say, it is better to keep records than to not, because if you are audited or reviewed and you don't have records, we can assess and the assessment might be more than what you actually do. And if you don't have the proof of what you did, that assessment stands. So keep uh, the, the records that you keep are for your benefit. The rule of thumb is three years plus the current year. I do know that federally they want you to keep things for longer than that. So that's kind of your choice. It's seven years, I believe, for the IRS, but it's three years for the state. Keep in mind, if you are auditor reviewed, there these are some of the things that we will ask to see, um, and I'll explain. There's, I'll explain to you right now what a review is. A review is something that is done by an agent. An audit is something done by an auditor. A review, we will look at two or three months of your records just to verify that you are doing things correctly, then we will, if you are not doing things correctly, we will get you educated where that you start doing them correctly. And they can, and a review can be requested or an agent can request one from you. And this is just additional documentation that you should probably keep. Um, like I said, mo most of the time, documentation is, is for your benefit, too. Okay, we do have a toll-free number still. And this is the email on this screen. This is the email for the business tax. That's something that you can email questions for or um, the original email that was sent out reminding you of this seminar. Lisa and my email address was on there. Um, feel free to give us a call. We do have our website's on here. Visit it, please. It's got a ton of information on there that's really, really helpful. Um, we do have local Department of Revenue offices, um, and that's on the next slide. I'll go through those. We do have a chat feature. Both Lisa and I are on there on occasion. Um, we rotate agents on the chat feature, and that's really been handy. That started a couple of years ago. Uh, publications, there's a, the website for the publication. That's where we have a quite a few tax facts on different topics. Um, a lot of the questions that we get uh, can be looked up on the tax facts and they're, they're um, in plain language. They're not in legalese, so it's easy to understand. This is our offices, our um, our field offices and our peer offices. The addresses are on here and our phone number. Um, feel free to stop in to visit us anytime or give us a call with questions. Okay, and that we do have, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we, are, we have YouTube videos and um, most people that have a license uh, get our newsletter, but if you don't, you can sign up on online. Um, other than that, that does end it. Unless we have any questions, we will stay on here for a little while longer um, for any questions. But keep in mind, a little plug, 
If you are a contractor or if you do bookkeeping, record keeping, CPA for a contractor, our contractor excise tax uh, seminar is Thursday, same time, and uh, both of us will be here to go through that. That is very detail-oriented with construction. Like I said, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email us, call us. We don't have text yet, so other than that, we'll just stick around. If you have questions, we'll be monitoring the chat for probably the next 10 minutes just to make sure that if anyone does have questions that they want answered, we can answer them for you. Thank you very much.